conversation I had with you put me on the path to finding it. So thank you. All right. Uh, let's get to this. Uh, guys, good afternoon. Let's get wild. Let's get super wild. Okay. Before we go, before we get anything <laughs> done, why did we have to call it Super Wild Card Weekend? I, I mean, it, this is not elementary school. You don't add super to the beginning of everything to make it better. I know the NFL thinks we're eight years old and watching <laughs> and have no actual minds of our own, kind of like if you're a wrestling fan, apparently to some people, the way the WWE thinks sometimes, <laughs> but that's another story for another time. But it, it, Super Wild Card Weekend is the dumbest thing ever. Well, so Rabbi, divisional doesn't the NFL have the trademark on the word super? Doesn't that like allow them to? That use doesn't mean they... anything though. So Super Bowl is a completely different. It, it's stupid. <laughs> just call it Wild Card Weekend from now on, and it'll be better. Whatever. Let's just get to it. I'm Steve Rabinowitz. <laughs> I'm Jay Kaplan. <laughs> I'm Edwin Schreit. and I'm Joe Tafaro. And welcome to the welcome to the super 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 divisional weekend episode of On the Sports Lines. <laughs> Uh, welcome back, Joe Tafaro, by the way. We'll be talking uh, a lot of different things. Nice to see you again, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we do We do need to talk about a little officiating cleanups, too. So we'll do that later. Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see if we can get into it. We have a lot of stuff to pack in. Uh, it, it, it's just really, this is the best weekend of the year, Bob Nunn. So we're going to... Uh, Again, thank you, Joe, for coming back here. Uh, you also are keeping these two to a time limit, and I love that. That's perfect for this show. <laughs> Let's get <laughs> to it. So, again, uh, we call it the divisional round, uh, and then we'll get to also to the most important Giants game in over a decade. That's actually a true statement. No facts needed. It is the most important Giants game in a decade. But first, I'm going to go to the dictionary and start us off, and this is another adjective called tumultuous, as we looked back from last weekend. This is the, this is the definition of tumultuous. Tumult, uh, defined as marked by tumult, loud, excited, and emotional. Now let me define tumult. A disorderly agitation or milling about of a crowd, usually with uproar and confusion of voices. Also see Jackson, comma, Lamar. <laughs> now that the Ravens season is over due to a wild card loss to the Bengals this past Sunday, Sunday, remember backup QB Lamar Hunley, you go through, honestly, <laughs> not over and miss it by a yard. Well, let's pay attention now to the guy who is usually under center, and that's Lamar Jackson. Lamar missed the last six games of Baltimore season this year and missed the last four the year before. Both became the driving cause of the Ravens not even getting a win in the playoffs. While former QBs like noted animal enthusiast Michael Vick responded to <laughs> Lamar's injury with a, I played the whole season with the toward MCL, put a brace on it, to a guy who Jackson actually knows, his former backup Robert Griffin III saying, He's doing the right thing and trying to be 100% of the feet for the future. Uh, Joe, Lamar is a free agent this yeah. offseason. So this is a little bit of a mess considering how this season ended specifically. What do you make of all of this? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. You know, of course, Harbaugh came out and said, you know, you're 2,000% going to be a Raven next year. And, you know, he tried to put a good spin on all this stuff. But I think it's tough in the locker room. I don't, I don't know how those guys responded to this, you know, because you never get the true story is, you know, our guys saying, hey, he could have played or he could have at least tried or he could have come out in the second half and played if we were really struggling or whatever. It was, it was a very close game. It's not like they were got they got blown out. I mean, except for one really stupid play where, like you said, you have to decide are you going to get pushed from behind or are you going to jump over the top? You can't do half and half and <laughs> expect yeah. that to happen so that you know i don't know how he's received in the locker room we've always heard stories we all know he's not a good passer outside the numbers we all know that it's mainly about running with him you know his little superman act a couple of years ago coming out of the locker room and running for 80 yards of touchdown and winning the game and <laughs> you know all of those type of things he's good at but you know here come the rumors right so the jet fans are all over this now you know we should have him, which could be the worst idea in the history of football to bring him to the Jets. But, you know, then the offensive coordinator for Baltimore resigns, whatever that means. Um, it means I didn't want to fire you, so you can leave now if you'd like to. 
Um, so I think it's going to be interesting. I'm not sure exactly what um, what's going to happen here. I think that Harbaugh really does want him. I think they're going to go out and try to find another offensive coordinator that fits his style, as we always talk about. Um, but he's going to want a lot of money. And here's a guy that's getting hurt a little bit more. You know, Robert Griffin, of all people, to say, oh, you know, he should stay healthy. And you go, well, that didn't quite work out for you. You went and got, you know, Dr. Andrews walked out on the field and said you were okay after you fell over on your own. And you you bought into that to get a new contract. So I, I don't know. I wouldn't give him a ton of money. But obviously, if you're a quarterback in the NFL these days and you're a starter, you're expecting $40, $45 million a year at his level. And that's what – that's why he didn't sign last year because he wanted to try to get the biggest contract ever. And, but again, Deshaun Watson, who can't play the position at all and is a sexual predator, got all kinds of money. So why wouldn't these guys think somebody's going to give me a contract? Um, you know, go, go down to Houston. If you really don't care about winning and all you care about is the money, then somebody's going to pay him. But I, I don't think he's worth any of it <coughs> at this point in his career. And, he hasn't proved anything to me. They haven't won anything. So, you know, he's really a one trick pony and we all know that. So one playoff uh, win, by the way, one, one, one playoff, playoff win. win. And it was yeah. in Tennessee where everybody yeah. seems to win in the playoffs. <laughs> uh, Anthony, there's a lot of, there, Anthony, there's a lot of ways you could go with this um, Lamar Jackson situation. Did you think it was the right decision for him to sit out the rest of the season? Given if he could have played. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say this is a guy who walks around with a knee brace, who's had knee injuries. I've had an MCL sprain, a partial tail. I can tell you flat out, even if Lamar Jackson had played, he would not have been 100%. He wouldn't have been Lamar Jackson that we're all familiar with. I mean, it's one thing to just, just throw on a brace, like Michael Vick say, and to go out and play. It's another thing to actually have to uh, elude a 300-pounder chasing you uh, at full speed. So, I, I mean, I mean, it, you could argue that he made the right decision to sit down, but I don't think it would have been much of a factor if he had played anyway. But how did the Baltimore Ravens get to this, get to this point in the first place is kind of question mark. I mean, think about it like this, and Joe made a great point. He hasn't won a whole lot of games as far as postseason, but he has a league MVP, and quarterbacks, good quarterbacks who are starters don't exactly grow on trees. And, and we've seen mm-hmm. a lot of sketchy quarterback play over the last few years. As far as the start hell, we just saw you see sketchy quarterback playing MetLife Stadium uh, with the team in green and white this, this whole season. But you look at it like this: the Ravens, for their part, um, have not really given Lamar Jackson a whole lot of weapons on the outside. I mean, Mark Andrews is a great tight end over the middle, but the closest thing he had to a receiver, Hollywood Brown, they traded him last offseason. And I think back to the game against Jacksonville earlier this year. There was you, you you would have broken a calculator how many drop passes was going on in that game from from the, from the Ravens standpoint. Well, that game should have been a blowout. It should have never been anywhere near close. But they dropped passes. There was a couple of drop uh, touchdown potential touchdown passes that eventually led the field goals and let Jack and kept Jacksonville in the game. You think about the the game against the Giants. It was drop passes was an issue as well. And, and Lamar Jackson, yeah, he's, he's a bit of a one-trick pony right now, but it's almost by out of necessity. He just doesn't have a lot to work with offensively. And and, there's, and the Ravens' mantra of being a ground-and-pound run, run off first offense uh, kind of contributes to that also. But it's just the fact that they let this kind of get to this point all this time. It's like, wait, he won the MVP two years ago. At that point, that should have been more of, Okay, let's try to work on something long term, and it kind of let it go all like this. And and I'm see, he's 26 years old. He's been banged up the last few years, so that's something that's going to be used against against Lamar Jackson. But the Ravens, I'm, I'm looking like, hey, little ball, well, not for nothing, but you 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 won two Super Bowls with really average quarterbacks. You actually have a good Amen, quarterback Jim. in your organization, yeah, in your organization. And you and you and you, because you want to be paying pensions, you were you were you you're, you're playing with fire to let them walk. Uh, it's kind of the, one of the head scratches. It's like, hey, look, Ray Lewis and company is not on the other side of that football, so you're not going to be holding guys, holding teams to like 10, 13 points a game anymore. So I don't know what the Ravens front office is thinking, letting it linger on this far. But 
I mean, the worst thing you could do right now is put them on a franchise tag. I'm just making things even worse. That's like a player's, player's worst nightmare to be put on a franchise tag and they can't negotiate with other teams. You almost have to play that season out uh, for that amount of money. I mean, it's, it's a lot of money, $45 million up front. But then you, it's almost like it's basically like you can't do anything else. And then if you risk and then with Mar Jackson now because you get banged up, you get injured again. Who knows what that 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 may happen um, as far as the rest of his career? Yeah, <clears throat> I wouldn't um, call Joe Flacco a game manager. By the way, Joe Flacco had one of the best postseasons that you could imagine. Had a very good touchdown to interception ratio. I'll still look at that while uh, Jay has his. Yeah, you know, I mean, in the war of words between a pair of formal former dual threat NFL quarterbacks and Michael Vick and Robert Griffin III on whether Jackson should have put a brace on it and played in the Ravens wild card game against the Bengals, I, I, I agree a thousand percent with RG3 when he said, quote, anyone saying Lamar Jackson should just brace it up and play regardless of the extent of his knee injury needs to get their head out of their ass. Um, you know, as I noted on the last week's show, uh, you know, Jackson revealed that he was suffering from a grade two PCL strain sprain that it's on the border of being a grade three strain. He still had inflammation on and surrounding his knee. Reports are, you know, that he was seen limping noticeably around the Ravens facility in the days leading up to the game. And that doesn't sound like the type of injury you can just put a brace on and play through. And teammates like tight end Mark Andrews and defensive back Marlon Humphrey said as much when asked um, as RG three also tweeted out, he was never the same after he tried to play through an ACL LCL injury in a 2012 wildcard game after previously suffering a PCL strain a few weeks earlier. Um, you know, he was never the same even after offseason surgery to repair the damage. Jackson's is a quarterback who is as reliant on his legs as his, as his, as his arm, arguably more so on his legs. So if he doesn't even have close to 100% mobility and is unable to execute an offense that is totally built around his dual threat skill set, then there's no point in him playing. For me, that's the off-field takeaway, the on-field takeaway. Here's my off-field takeaway. Um, the NFL is a business, and Jackson, who has been in negotiations with the Ravens for a contract extension, understands that if he was to further injure himself and thus extend his time on the injured list, he would not get the contract terms he's looking for. He knows he still has years left on his prime, so why would he put himself in a position to not only lose future playing time, but future dollars when he knows the Ravens really can't afford to not pay him to continue being their QB one, their QB one right? What will be interesting for me to watch is how the search for Greg Roman's replacement as offensive coordinator goes. Roman stepped down this week to pursue other opportunities as the brief press release went. Um, and what's interesting to me is head coach John Harbaugh said that Jackson will have input um, on Roman's replacement. Um, it'll be interesting to see how that affects things going forward. It's widely known throughout the NFL that Roman is a run first guy, which is what Harbaugh's philosophy leans to. And we saw that to a certain extent in the wildcard game, but Roman's past concepts were very vanilla and easily diagnosed by defenses from what I'm reading and hearing, um, especially when Jackson was out. And there was, and you know, Anthony talked about the the lack of talent at the wide receiver positions. Both of those situations were readily um, apparent against the Bengals. So, I mean, will the new guy be from a more pass first offensive scheme or philosophy? Is Jackson even when he's 100 percent healthy? And there's a big question as to whether he will be by training camp. Is he even capable of executing that type of scheme? We all know that there is a there is a school of thought across the NFL that he do, who do not believe that he has the skill set as a passer to do that. All of this, Jackson's health, his contract, who the no offensive coordinator would be. These are all the headlines of, of an offseason of what to watch for in Baltimore. There wasn't one time this past season where you had uh, Jacob Dobbins, um, Rashad <clears throat> Bateman, and Ronnie Stanley available in the same game. And you had your number one running back, wide receiver, and left tackle. So there's still a lot that needs to be done. That's why I think coordinators are now the first ones to get fired. It's like, oh, the coach sucks. We'll give him one more chance. Let's just <laughs> coordinate. Yeah. But uh, also, I do have to say this. I think there's a little bit of everything in there. Yes, Lamar Jackson is a former MVP. And yes, Lamar Jackson, for the first four weeks of this season, was playing probably as good as his MVP season. <laughs> but when you miss the games at the time when you miss them, you don't have – don't come back. Obviously, don't come back. But I do think he does – he can still play. If it's, like, close – you can't be – I don't know, because you miss that much time at the end of the season. Once is an accident, 
twice as concerning. And if it happens again, you're going to be wondering why you gave him all of that money. And but again, the price between you saw in that wild card game, a Tyler Huntley offense did its job and understood the assignment really well. But when it came to crunch time, Tyler Huntley couldn't make that play. So in just one game, Lamar can actually build a case. You can build a case for Lamar and you can build a case against Lamar at the same exact time. It's going to be very interesting to see what Baltimore does this offseason and hopefully they do it quickly because I don't want to hear anything more about it again. Especially since uh, Lamar's looking for a completely guaranteed contract a la Deshaun Watson. So that's that's an added layer to that whole thing. So we'll and if see. You want Deshaun, yeah. and, if, and Deshaun Watson money and what Russell Wilson has really set the uh, market up exponentially now. Whether they deserve anybody it or can not. Ask for oh, money. yeah. Yeah. Anybody can ask I'll for I'll say that. Points. All right. I love Finally. What were you going to say, yes. Anthony? Let me get your point. <laughs> what were you going to say, Anthony, before we go on? No, I was going to say, if you got the world to motion, you'll see my love life as part of definitions also for the last <laughs> 10 years. So just throw that out there. Like, I know I know tumultuous when I see one. We, we, we all know tumultuous in some shape, manner, or form. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, Giants and, don't and, learn and, it later today. <laughs> I, I wish, wish, I wish I I have and that's just a why have I seen any data some motions in Baltimore, Maryland? Have I seen with the Ravens organization nice. and Lamar Jackson at this point? Nicely have, you done. Done. <laughs> have you seen the Orioles in this set in this decade? Um, on to the New York <laughs> football giants. It has been 11 years since they reached the divisional round, the promised land. Wow. A very, very familiar foe beats them there in division rival, the top seeded Philadelphia Eagles. This is the third time the two sides have met in the last seven weeks. The matchup on January 8th in Philadelphia was a close 22-16 affair for Philly, but considering the Giants played with many backups, we can kind of forget about that. The matchup at MetLife Stadium on December 11th can be forgotten about as well, because I was in the stadium that day, and I blocked the whole entire game out of my mind. <laughs> something about 48-22 Philly, two TDs for Jalen Hurts and Miles Sanders. That's all I can remember. Let's move on. So back in the city of brotherly love, the Giants get a third chance at the bird. So the great stat that I've just loved this whole entire week. It may mean nothing, because I know Jay doesn't like past performance meaning future uh, performance. But remember this, the last six times... The Giants have played a one seed in the playoffs. They have one. You have to go back to 1986 and the Super Bowl 20 champ Chicago Bears. Yes, we've referenced Super Bowl 20 now two times in the last two weeks on this show. <laughs> uh, but that was the last time they lost in the divisional round in 1986. Will Philly join the company of San Francisco, Buffalo, Dallas, Green Bay, and New England? Remember. Two of the last three times the Giants have been eliminated in the playoffs, it's been because of Philly in 2006 and 2008 season. So let's examine and ask some questions to our friend Joe Tafaro. Go ahead, Jay. Uh, you know, normally when a playoff game is is a repeat of a matchup from the regular season, especially if it's between, between teams from the same division, we usually have a pretty decent sample size of information and data to look at when preparing a preview like this. But in this instance, we really don't. The Giants were missing some key pieces on offense in the week 14 loss and pretty much rested everybody in the week 18 loss. The game plan that the Giants used in week 14, Saquon Barkley focused running game as the, you know, as the engine of an offense that was very heavy, maybe too heavy on play action. It's evolved into something a lot more diverse and creative, especially in the passing game where the Giants have tried to create second level throwing windows for quarterback Daniel Jones to connect on crossing routes, middle of the field sit routes and deep you know, in breaking routes. And they've also leaned more into Jones's dual threat skill set and much improved decision making. That all resulted in the Giants putting up 31 points and 431 total yards in the wild card win over the Vikings, with Jones shredding them through the air for 301 passing yards on 24-35, almost 69%. Two scores, no picks, a 114.1 passer rating, a team leading 78 yards on 17 carries on the ground as he became the first quarterback in NFL history with 300-plus passing yards, two passing TDs, and 70-plus rushing yards in a postseason game. However... Unlike the Vikings, his defense allowed the fourth most points, the second most total yards, and the second most passing yards in the NFL. The Eagles' defense allowed the eighth fewest points, second fewest total yards, and the fewest passing yards in the NFL. Joe, with all that as a lead-up, what will the Giants have to do differently on offense, and who or what will be the key for them in this third go-around with the hated Eagles? Yeah, I, you know, I think as last week was, 
you know, it's Daniel Jones. And I mean, they only have two playmakers on this team. It's Daniel Jones and Saquon Barkley. So, you know, as much as you want to look too deep into some of this stuff, you know, it's going to be about, can they get the ball out of his hands quick enough? Can they protect Jones enough to get some of those, those nice routes that they now run? I thought it was funny to see Jason Garrett on Sunday night football talking about <laughs> their giants offense and how they've made such changes. And I go, it's the same guys you had. You just didn't know. He to, also to, said to, that a boy <laughs> Daniel during those same yeah. highlights, by the way, that you were referencing. Just awful. Just an awful take. Um, but I think that the key here is, you know, can you build an offense that's going to be quick outlet passes? Can you keep from keep from that pressure package that you're going to see from the Eagles? Because they those are the guys that can get there with only four guys or five guys. And it's going to be very, very interesting to see how the offensive line holds up. You know, does Daniel have to run a lot more on non, non-design runs? But if you do go back in the past of these teams and not just go this year, but go back a couple of years with Daniel Jones, he's had some huge games against them running the ball and on called runs on, on option plays on a few different things where he's kept it and and run around the edges. The famous one where he fell down, where he ran 90 yards or whatever it was, you know, he's had some big games against them in that instance. And as, as I said to you last week, you suddenly have the utmost confidence in, in Daniel Jones. I mean, to for a normal giant offense to lose 10 yards on a holding play on the opening series, you say, all right, they're going to get 12 of this back and they're going to punt. Or they lost four yards on the opening play on the second half. And you go, oh, yeah, okay, they're going to get to this 18-yard line and they're going to have to punt. It's like, it's a completely different team at this point. And I think it's like you said, Jay, it's the routes that they're running. It's, you know, it certainly isn't the athletes that they have, but it's the routes that they're running, the concepts that they have where you take those two outside guys and you run them on crossing routes and then you put Barkley in behind them. And there's obviously there's no one there on defense. And again, in the manner that he's playing now where he wants to be the guy and he wants to be it, he is never not getting that first down. You know, when he gets two yards away, and the linebackers come and you're going, yeah, he'll dive for this at this point, or he'll put his shoulder down or he'll cut back. Nothing fancy, right? He's just going to get you what you need to do at this point. So I think all those little things are going to be are going to be key of how quickly can they get the ball out of his hands? How much can they use the run game? But the Eagles aren't great against the run straight up. No. Um, but you know, can you what are they going to choose to do? You, you know, you always have to have that adjustment period of what are, what are the Eagles going to choose to do? And Minnesota last week, you know, made the mistake of, okay, we'll play back. And so, because, well, you know, we think this is what you're going to do because of what you did to us last time. And so they ran the ball first until they moved a couple of guys up and then they put the split safety in the whole bit, you know, and, and mm-hmm. you were able to read that. And Patrick Peterson looked awful normal when he yeah. – when he was getting beat by Isaiah Hodgins on, uh, yeah, on the like he had no idea that he was going to go to the middle of the field, or he expected to see, you know, somebody else there. There should have been a safety there, or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. So I think that again, the the concept of the offense is so much better from earlier in the year, even though it was only four or five weeks ago. You still feel like there's a chance of doing this, and I think that the key to the offensive side of the game is again how many design runs can they get how much can Barkley do on his own at this point or Brita and can you get can you get some of those throws where you know can you fake some of those outside smoke screens and go back to the other side can you do a couple of things where it's not obvious um you know the Giants showed you last week how you play those smoke screens against (laughs) against Minnesota I think Darnay Holmes can't tack, can't cover a guy that goes more than three yards down the field, but he sure can get that guy that's in the back. <laughs> uh, he yeah. reads those things really well, and he just because he ignores the other guy. You know, once he realizes it's going to be a screen to the to the back receiver, he completely ignores the front guy and makes sure he gets around him. Now, if Minnesota was any good at all, that you would have maybe seen that and said, "Hey, you know, we might want to fake this once because." that front guy who's supposed to be blocking is, is just standing there by at that point. He's not doing anything. He's just, maybe you fake the smoke screen and have that guy go behind homes and, and get some sort of play out of it. So I think that again, offensively, I think it's going to be all on again, 
the two big guys and Breda to maybe get some yards on the ground and then um, loosen it up a little bit. I think having that establishment and making sure that they don't know what that the Eagles don't actually know what the Giants are going to do, especially getting the five to six yards on first down is huge. By the way, two stats that will kind of uh, help with Joe's stuff there. Eagles were two away from the NFL record for sacks this year. They had 70. And that secondary is not the Vikings secondary. This is not, it was not the same Patrick Peterson. Most of that team has 92 plus numbers on coverage ratings. So you're not going to get the same open holes that you got last week at the Vikings game. No one will get the same open holes, I have a feeling. Anthony, go ahead with the defense. All right, last week, uh, well, Wait Martindale, um, well, what was one of the things I was pointing out was that um, they blitz. He toned down the blitz a little bit against Minnesota. Mm-hmm. They played more of a zone bracket coverage to kind of um, like uh, account for Justin Jefferson. Obviously, he was the main point of the game plan last week, and they took him out of the game pretty much after that that opening drive. Now you got the Philadelphia Eagles with all their weapons. You have Devontae Smith and AJ Brown, but also Y'all went about a running game, a, a guy like Boston Scott, who's been a bit of a giant killer throughout his career, and you have to worry about Jalen Hurts, the runner, not just the quarterback. And you, and obviously, you, you rep, Rabbi referenced the game he was at. Well, it was just a, a, a complete free fall offensively for the Eagles because the Giants are missing a lot of key stars defensively. Now, going into the uh, round three in Philadelphia, what are some of the defensive adjustments the Giants have to make to, to pretty much kind of neutralize what is a very potent field of the Eagle offense? Yeah, and this is a difficult task because, you know, like you said, last week in Minnesota, you were able to, you know, you kept Justin, you know, and again, all of us were texting during the game. You know, even that, you know, it's funny, we got on Jay a little bit for going, hey, they took 10 minutes and they got no points or you got three points and you go, <laughs> Yeah, but you kept Justin Jefferson on the off the field for ten minutes, and and what they what they managed to do last week by playing that soft coverage and giving Cousins the five yard outs and the six yard outs and the little things to keep moving down the field was they made Minnesota take time off the clock, and so instead of it being an offensive point where you were saying oh we'll, you know we'll run the ball and we'll take time off the clock to keep you up they made them kill their own clock they made them take too much time to get down the field on every one of their drives. I mean, every drive the Giants had last week was 75 or 80 yards. It was pretty amazing, but it was in four or five plays, some of them in six plays. And But you had you made Minnesota take 10, 12 plays. And say, so it was actually a defensive gem by saying, well, we want to run time off the clock, but we're going to make you do it. We, we're not going to do it on offense. We're going to attack on offense, but we're going to make the, the – but our defense is going to make you take time off the clock. So I think if you can limit it to a point, but like you said, Anthony, this isn't one guy and then hopefully the tight end doesn't go crazy. You know, like last week you were able to live with him getting his catches and stuff because of what you were doing and make sure you make some good tackles. You know, when you got three guys basically catch the ball plus a good tight end, plus a running game, plus a quarterback that I'm sure is not going to take a knee when he gets outside the pocket because he doesn't want to get hurt. You know, he's going to play full out in this game, no matter how he feels. This, this is a matter of strapping it up and going out there. And if you get hurt, you get hurt. Um, He has to do this at this point. So I think it's a tough, tough task, but it'll be interesting to see what Wink comes up with because, you know, he's going to come up with some adjustment um, and play it a little bit different in it, but it's nice to see. And we talked about this from day one was, He's not, you know, Wink's not a one-trick pony. He's not, you know, everybody calls him the big blitzer and blah, 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 but he's obviously can adjust to any game plan that they come up with. He's very Belichick-like in that way of this is what we're going to do, right? The Super Bowl against Buffalo, Belichick said, hey, the running back's going to get 100 yards, and everybody thought he was nuts, and they said, no, but we're going to punish the receivers. Back in that day, you could actually hit a receiver um, after he caught the ball. So, you know, but again, you have to come up with a game plan against these guys. And I think it's a matter of, again, you have to rush with discipline. This isn't Kirk Cousins who's going to be standing in the same place and get rid of the ball quickly. This is Jalen Hurts who's going to move around. He's going to slide. He's going to run. You have to be really careful with that. Maybe they go spy. Maybe you put Landon Collins out there to 
stand sort of as a linebacker, or, you know, stop because he can get up there to stop the regular run, which will help you. And then you put him as a spy and tell him don't come until he starts to, to get across the line because otherwise he's going to suck you up and he's going to run around you anyway, or he's going to be able to throw it. So I think it's, again, it's a difficult thing. And the other thing that's difficult about this matchup for the giants is he's, he's comfortable throwing that ball up to those guys and see, seeing what happens. I think Kirk cousins didn't do that enough last week. You know, again, again, even on the last drive, he said, I wasn't comfortable throwing it towards Jefferson. He like, why not? You know, look what happened in the miracle of Minnesota. Look at have all these great plays that have happened over the years has been quarterback throwing the ball up and seeing what happens. Look you what know. happens in terms of defensive pass interference, which yes. is a very likely possibility if you put <laughs> it in the right spot is really right. another so, thing too. Yeah. So I, I think, I think, again, I think that's why cousins gets the deserved bad rap sometimes. And again, I don't know what he's really thinking, but his answers are awful to say, yeah, I really wasn't comfortable throwing it at Jefferson at that point. And he go, well, why the hell not? Who else are you going to throw it to? It's a, you know, that's the be- he's the best receiver in football for a reason. Give him a chance at least. Even if, again, if you put it in a spot where only he can get it or you put it in a 50-50 spot and he's so big and long and he's got great hands, why not take that chance? I mean, you're, you're going to lose a game anyway. You might as well take the chance to throw it to your best receiver. And I don't, I don't think Jalen Hurts, you know, coming from where he came from and the way he's played, I don't think he's scared of that. I think he sees – some of those guys out there, even in double coverage, and he's comfortable throwing it up and putting it in a spot where he figures they'll go up and fight for it Um, because those guys are really good, those wide receivers. So, again, I think it's a – I don't know what the adjustment will be. I mean, Wink Martindale will will definitely have some sort of plan, and you'll notice it right away, I think. Um, I thought the announcing crew did a good job. Greg Olson, you know, kept saying it all day long kept repeating the same thing all day long, but he was right. It was like, this is a different defense. And obviously this is the adjustment they chose to make. And again, he kept saying the same thing. So when do you change? When do you switch? When do you show a different look? And it was on the, the last series, as we talked about before we came on. Um, but so I'm, I'm excited to see what he comes up with, but I think maybe you go land in Collins spy and hopefully your defense, you know, can then, get some pressure on him to make him get rid of the ball quick. And those guys just don't go crazy because those are three really, really good receivers. And again, you're going to have to stop the run. Jay, as we always say, first down is kind of key, right? You can't, you yeah. can't let them get six, seven yards on a run up the middle um, yeah. on first down. So your, your goal is to prevent second and manageable. Exactly. Exactly. So well, the Eagles have been the key, the second and manageable this year. And let's focus on and that's of that on the uh, Eagles for a second here. Okay. So I'm gonna name you five guys that kind of explain a couple of things and you tell me which one is the biggest key to stop. It's a very it's it's almost a Sophie's choice type situation. But <laughs> Jalen Hurts, who is apparently fully healthy, not even listed on the injury report this week, which is a little bit of a surprise. 4,461 yards of offense this year, 35 total TDs, basically doing it in a true 16-game season because he played 16 games. And it'll be the first time, by the way, that we'll have two 7-yard, 100-yard rushers against each other in the postseason. So at got at quarterback, yes, I, you know what I meant. Uh, <laughs> so you got that. Uh, you have A.J. Brown and uh, Devontae Smith. They are the only team, uh, teammate to grow with 85-plus receptions and 1,000 yards this season. They had 20 catches and 296 yards this season against New York. And then you have the running game. Miles Sanders went for 144 yards against uh, the Giants in Week 14. Austin Scott has over half of his touchdowns in his NFL career against the Giants, the Giants. of 18, which is insane. So if you were to fill in the blank here in this sentence and then explain your answer, obviously the Giants have the best possibility of winning if they stop blank first. Yeah, it's Jalen Hurts. Um, I, I don't know how healthy he is. And again, he did, you know, he threw some poor balls in that game, in that ending of end of the season game um, through that interception in the end zone. He threw a couple of balls that were kind of weird. Um, and I don't know if that, and I don't see that as being part of his injury. So that was, 
to me, that would be a little concerning if I'm an Eagles fan to just go, well, why was he so poor in that game? We understand he didn't run, but the fact that he didn't have to think about running, that all he was going to do was throw the ball. How did he play so poorly and, and throw a couple of picks and, you know, especially red zone opportunities, things like that. So, but I think he's the key only because of his running ability. And, and if he is healthy, um, which I, which you have to believe he is, I don't think he's fully healthy. I, I'm, I'm sure. I, I don't this, think anybody is honestly fully right. healthy at that position at that time right. of the season with the way he plays that with the way you right. play anyway. Right. So, so, you know, do you get a hit on him? Do you, you know, legally, do you, does he fall the wrong way on something? Does he just, do they do a quarterback sneak with him? Cause these coaches are so stupid that, you know, maybe he takes a big hit. Look at Daniel Jones. The guy came across from Minnesota last week and purposely hit him in the face on that quarterback sneak at the top of the thing. I mean, if I'm, you know, if I'm the one of the linebackers for the Giants, if he's going to want to sneak it up there, I'm aiming for that right shoulder and I'm going to hit him as hard as I can legally and see what happens. So you don't know if that's going to affect anything. I don't know if it really affects his throwing that much, but you know, when you start out, and we've talked about this a million times, when you start out a season playing the way they played, there's a drop off somewhere. And it starts to become, you know, again, that's why this time of the season is always interesting and you see guys getting hurt or you see different things, different elements, as you say. So we know his legs are okay. So that's going to be a key. So we'll see exactly how good he can throw the ball. And um, I, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's just me trying to, you know, <laughs> trying not to be too over the top as far as a fan goes, but I think that he is definitely the key to this entire game. I think Miles Sanders gets 80, 85 yards. I think Boston Scott probably scores because they give it to him at that point. You know, the fact that he only scores touchdowns he because always, they only put him in when they're on the two yard line, that doesn't mean to me, that doesn't mean against the, against the Giants, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I don't find that to be a curse. You know, the guy isn't scoring from the 20 yard line. He's scoring from the two. So I'm not worried about that. Somebody was going to score anyway, but I think it, I think at this point, he's the key to this because again, you can't take away one of those receivers and expect the other guys not to do anything. You can't do it. We did the Justin Jefferson and go, Oh, Adam Thielen, you can have all the opportunities you want because you're not as good as you used to be. And we can cover you with one guy and a, and a safety coming over from the other I, I don't think it that I don't think it's that simple this week. So I put it on stop and hurts because he can if he throws a few balls up for grabs that we actually get lucky for. Again, we have McKinney back now. We have some guys in there that are ball hawks that play a little bit better than they did in the first two games. Um, and you know, that first game was just a it wasn't a because they scored so many points. And again, I know you were there, Rabbi, but it wasn't the defense that gave up, you know, three long drives to no. start the game. You know, it, no, was just, it, was, it was all around just bad karma, bad luck, bad ball handling. Everything went wrong in that first couple of things. And then they only gave up, you know, a few points after that, and they came back a little bit. So I think it was one of those games that just didn't start well and, and then just kind of rolled out of proportion from there. I think the last game was more of what this game's going to be. And you can't just go, oh, well, we got better talent on the field, so we'll get a few more turnovers or we'll get a few more stops. You know, you have to still play the game. Not yeah. if you don't have uh, the one thing that I noticed, by the way, that just amazes me is the Eagles have won the last three against the Giants, but I remember the game in November of last year. Last year, where it was a 10-7 game and Jalen Hurts looked like a pop Warner quarterback out there against a mediocre Giants defense. The Giants defense that's not at the level that they're at right now. Right. And there were so many simple, simple secondaries. And this wasn't like early in the year. This was late in the year. And this team ended up being a playoff team. And the, the like growth of what Jalen was then to now in just 15 months is just a little surprising to me. And you always wonder if that one game is going to come back. And it hasn't really come back. The closest we've seen that Jalen Hurts this season was the game, ironically enough, before he got injured against Chicago in the first half. The only, and the only thing I'll say that's a little bit um, kind of off point here that I don't usually do, but... The white hat in this game, Cleet Blakeman, 
is the worst of the playoff referees. Mm-hmm. And he has, been known, he has been known to make some calls that he couldn't possibly have seen, but he still calls it on roughing the passer play on Tom Brady a couple of years ago. And, and, and he's the lowest graded white hat, even though they've tried to groom him because he was an ex Nebraska quarterback. He's tall right. and thin. He looks good. He does all the signals. Perfect. That's what they want but he hasn't grown into the position. He's not very good at what he does. And so that scares me a little bit because it's not the top rated crew who obviously will be tomorrow night. They'll get those guys. Um, But again, the way the NFL does it now, they never used to do it this way, but the guys that get these early games, like all the guys that worked last week, you won't see again for the rest of the playoffs. You may see one of them. They give them a game and then they're done. And they save now the, you know, the, the, Super Bowl white hat used to be the guy in the championship game used to be, you know, they used to walk them through. Best divisional game, right? It's the best divisional yeah, like, game person. If I'm not yeah, and, they, and then they do, and they, because they wanted them to work with their crews because they're all-star crews. They're not their regular crews. So they wanted them to kind of work with that. We do that in high school. If you're on the finals crew, we work four weeks together all through the playoffs because we want to get used to each other and, and work as a seven man. We never work seven man during the season. We only work five man. So you get in the playoffs, all of a sudden you're working with seven guys. Everything's a little bit different. So if we're, if you're on the finals crew to go to the state championship game, like I was this year, my little coin, uh, like I was, <laughs> you work with the same crew all the way through. And it really helps you by the last week because you're reading each other's mind. You know, you've gone over things that have changed and, and it's a little bit easier. I, I don't particularly like the way the NFL does it, but, you know. That by the way, like by the way, the Eagles are 13-1 and one all time yeah. in complete Lakeland, Lakeland games. games. And, he also, and he also did the game earlier this year. between right. the, not, uh, not to add fuel to, to, to that fire. Yeah, well, but, you know, that's, <laughs> that, that's all the conspiracy theory stuff that I don't no, know. No, I know, but I just thought it was funny because it's very rare to see a team – be 13 and one with a specific with a specific referee yeah, yeah. And, and not to add fuel to the fire guys Uh-oh. but um keep an eye on dallas goddard throughout this game uh, the oh, giants course, yeah. we against that. tight ends this year and the last yeah. two games against minnesota hawkinson ate them a lot <laughs> it'll be interesting to see what you know sirianni gleans from the tape looking at how the vikings were able to exploit tight end matchups and how he'll use goddard uh wow. on you know tonight as and I'll I'll defer to Rabbi on this one only because Jay, you're really a Steeler fan. You're not really a Giants fan. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, you can go back the last ten years, and it's always been the tight end that's beaten up on the Giants defenses. It doesn't matter. All the guys in Dallas did it. All the guys in Washington. Did. Every year, that's always been the soft point in in our defense. So it'll you know, be interesting. I can see multiple touchdowns for Goddard tonight, but it'll be a very interesting game. One thing to note, though. But Dory Jackson on AJ Brown. I'm just saying those two know each other from Tennessee, so that might help out a right. bunch. We'll see what happens. All right, gents, I'm going to sit back and just comment as you three <laughs> talk about the other divisional matchups over here. We could have a weekend like last. You know, all but one of the teams, 11 teams, had leads in last week's game. Sorry, Tampa. You suck. You broke the <laughs> this, weekend, this weekend could be, you know, Wild, not super, but wild. So let's see what to watch out for from these standout three games. Anthony, um, it says here that in the first playoff game today, um, there is a team hailing from the county of Duval. (laughs) The Jacksonville Jaguars are heading to Arrowhead to play the Kansas City Chiefs. The Jaguars have lost a grand total one game since a week 10 loss in Kansas City against the Chiefs 27-17. So how do the Jags make their way to put themselves from the number one pick in the 2020 and 2021 seasons to conference finalists in the 2023 seasons? What are you looking for in this game? Well, uh, two things I'm looking for. Number one is which Trevor Lawrence is going to show up because if the Trevor Lawrence and the post half show up, they're in trouble. I mean, I mean, look, give the Jacksonville Jaguars all the credit in the world. We'll talk about what Brandon Stanley didn't do in that game in our next segment. But <laughs> as bad as they were in the first half, they had 106 total yards of offense, six post downs. And Trevor Lawrence did a better job of throwing to the other team than his own receivers, four interceptions. And, and I was just texting Rabbi during the game. I was like, okay, 
how many uh, how many more other stuff we want to have before halftime because this is becoming more exciting than Al Michaels and Tony Dungy's commentary at this point. <laughs> but 10 of 24, 77 yards, and, and, you, and you're down 27 nothing. You can't afford to, to, to do that against uh, can't, the Kansas City Chiefs led by Patrick Mahomes. They need the Trevor Lawrence that has been great over this six-game stretch where he's played phenomenal and getting Jacksonville to the playoffs and to the division title. They need the guy that shows up in the second half, throws for 211 yards, three touchdowns, did not turn the ball over in the second half. Uh, played through has um, Joseph Paul and talked about throwing out but well, just before he went on went on he went live uh, a thumb injury that he was kind of bleeding out of and, for, and again we'll talk about Brandon Stanley's um, what not to do in situations like that in our next segment. But you think about it like this: this is a rematch from only this year. Kansas City won 27-17, and that was actually ironically enough Patrick Mahomes statistically his best game. Due for 331 yards and four touchdowns. Now, if you're the Jacksonville Jaguars, you got to take care of the football. I think that's pretty obvious. Get the running game going. Try to loosen up a very good Kansas City pass rush against a, what, what is a, a very good Jacksonville offensive line for that matter. So that's another match to, to look forward to. But you can't fall behind 27 nothing. I mean, this game would be over before you know it. The fans will be back out in, in the parking lot of Alabama Stadium going back to tailgating. By the way, they showed up at 9 p.m. last night to start tailgating for, to, for this afternoon's game. I mean, you got to love a rabbit fan base. Um, which <laughs> well, it's a 4.30 start. Has. You got you to get up again. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 3.30 starts acting. <laughs> yeah, but I mean that's the one thing Jasper has to do. take care of the football, try to uh, control the offense, control the momentum. The longer you can keep hold of the football, means the more Patrick Mahomes is on the sideline drinking Gatorade with and, and that offense sitting on the sideline collecting collecting more of us from having the the, the one week the the first round by. So that's the thing I want to look forward to. Which Terrell Lawrence is going to show up? The the first half that looked like an inexperienced quarterback. Or the guy who ended up at Waffle House after leaving one of the best court, best comebacks in, in playoff history. So that is the one thing I'm going to look forward to this afternoon. I will yeah, say yeah. That. Uh, uh, Anthony, you know, you, you brought up Lawrence's first half and second half. I texted you guys this during um, after the game. Trevor Lawrence's first seven possessions, he was 5 of 18, 35 yards, those four picks, a zero passer rating, and the Jags are down 27 nothing. From that point on, 23 of 29, 253 yards, those four touchdowns, a 142.6 passer rating. The Jags scored on their final five possessions to win the game. That's just, I mean, talk about a tale of two halves, which is a term you guys have heard me use countless times, but holy crap, was that a tale of two halves. <laughs> There's, there's another reason why that was the case, and we'll talk about that in just a little while. But uh, <laughs> one, one thing I did very, it's very interesting is this is only Mahomes' fifth year uh, at the helm of the Chiefs. He will now have played all four AFC South teams and playoff games at home. He is, by the wow. way, undefeated at home in this, uh, undefeated at home in this round. <laughs> Rabbi with the nugget. <laughs> so that's going to be a very interesting, be a very interesting game. Also. Doug Peterson and Andy Reid know each other like the back of each other's hand. That's going to be right. In fact, Doug Peterson said, I've known Andy Reid for, been influenced by Andy Reid coaching for over 50% of my whole life. Wow. Go back to Green Bay. Eight to 30 years. Yeah, Green Bay. To 30 Green Bay. <laughs> that coaching tree is insanity. All right. Uh, Jay, up to you now. It just seemed like uh, it just seemed like the Bills and Bengals were going to be in the playoffs right? after the unfortunate mm -hmm. events with Demar Hamlin a little less than three weeks ago. But 20 days after that unfinished game, they meet again to see who will get to another AFC championship tilt to give you what to watch for on both sides. Yeah, I mean, for the Bengals, I'm looking at how effective and efficient will Joe, Joe Burrow be against the Bills' pass rush um, and against their red zone defense. Uh, you know, we talked about the injuries to the Bengals' offensive line. They were out without their starting right guard and right tackle coming into the wild card game with the Ravens, lost their starting left tackle during it, and whether or not that would prevent Burrow from doing Joe Burrow things. Turns out really didn't. Despite being sacked four times, Burrow did just enough, 23 of 32, a little under 72%. 209 yards, a TD, no picks, passer rating of 
and a one-yard touchdown run. It was just enough for the Bengals with that huge assist from Sam Hubbard's 98-yard fumble return touchdown to escape with the win over their AFC North rivals. However, I'm not sure another performance like that, producing only 234 total yards of offense and only 17 offensive points, will be enough to leave Orchard Park with a win against a much better Buffalo Bills team. So what am I? What will? Getting the ball out of out quick to mitigate those offensive line issues and ending red zone drives with sevens instead of threes. Burrow threw the ball in less than two seconds on 16 of his 32 attempts in the wild card game, completed 13 for 7.3 yards in attempt. Comparison, held the ball two seconds or longer. He was only 10 of 16, averages 5.8 per attempt. Actually more efficient when unloading the ball immediately. Part of that, due to the scheme the Ravens used, they played deep, refusing to allow big plays. But it also speaks to the effectiveness with which – Burrow can execute the quick game, keeps the pass rush at bay, avoids the bad down and distance situation that often lead to those sacks. Another part of it was how often the Bengals used empty sets when their opponent was in a too high coverage scheme, something the Bills use quite often. Empty formations define will define the Bills coverages pre-snap for Burrow, which will put him in a position to read it quickly and get the ball out with expediency. In the regular season, in empty sets, Burrow, 78 of 114, 68.4%. Ball gets out quick in those sets. Burrow hitting on quick in-breakers to T. Higgins, underneath choice routes to Tyler Boyd, or slant throws to Jamar Chase, and we all know how those throws can lead to explosive plays. Then there's the Bengals in the red zone. Burrow has 23 red zone touchdown passes this season. It's third best in the NFL behind Mahomes, 34, and the guy on the other side, Josh Allen, who had 24, only one interception. And since their week five loss to the Ravens, the Bengals have scored touchdowns on an incredible 17 straight red zone trips, not counting kneel downs. They are overall in a midst of a 30 of 42 stretch. That's a 71.4 touchdown rate in the red zone, fourth best in the league. However, that Bengals offense only has five red zone trips total in their last three games, which is as much about their struggles to score as in general as anything, which I talked about on the last show. And for the third straight game, they'll face a top three red zone defense. Set, but th- a little under 39% since Thanksgiving, giving up only seven TDs and 17 trips in their last seven games. Get the ball out quickly to avoid what's going to be an all an assault on a depleted offensive line. Give your playmakers a chance to make plays and get the ball into the red zone and put up sevens when you get there. Pretty straightforward on paper, right? But as my best friend always says, we don't play the games on paper. And Nisa's right. But if Cincinnati can do these three things often enough, the Bengals winning streak is going to reach nine games and they'll be one step closer to the Super Bowl. For the Bills, how often Josh Allen playing hero ball is going to come back to bite the Bills in the ass? We all know that his ability to create huge game-turning plays is one of his best attributes and one of the biggest strengths of the Bills' offense. But it can also, in the blink of an eye, become their greatest cause for concern when he tries to do too much, and that usually leads to back-breaking turnovers, especially in the run zone. The Bills finished the regular season with 27 giveaways. Only the Colts and the Texans gave away the ball more. And we know where they'll be picking in the draft this year. And Allen leads the NFL in actual turnovers with 19, 14 picks, five fumbles. And he leads the league in turnover worthy plays with 29 per pro football focus. He added three more in the wild card win over the Dolphins. The two picks weren't completely his fault, but when you add that to the number of times he's put the ball in harm's way, he fumbled three times, lost one, and that one became a Miami scoop and score for a defensive touchdown. You can say that his propensity for turnovers can have a dramatic game-changing potential. He has a, a tendency to drive too, too much when he's looking downfield, ignoring shorter, more open routes instead. Going for the home run plays where the route may not be as open, and when those risks don't generate rewards, it leads to drives ends with nothing at best and turnovers at worst. Bills have nine turnovers in the last three games, and the Buffalo's offense has a league-high seven turnovers inside the 20. No other team has more than five. Of Allen's 14 interceptions, five of them came in the red zone. That's the most in the NFL. His four fumbles inside the 20 are also the most in the NFL. And of the 32 quarterbacks who attempted at least 25 passes in the red zone, Allen's passer rating of 79 ranks 30th, ahead of only former Raider Derek Carr at 74-6 and the Browns' Deshaun Watson at 72 those, though, as previously noted, he did have those 24 touchdown passes in the red zone, good for second best in the NFL. Allen and the Bills can get away with this style of offense, meaning reckless, against a less talented team like the Dolphins, though they almost didn't, 
who are playing with their third string quarterback, a guy who has limitations in a passer. And because their own defense forced two turnovers to add to the 27 they had in the regular season, as well as putting up four sacks and shutting down Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle held those guys to a combined 10 catches and 113 yards on 22 targets. However, we all know the Bengals have a much better offense and Joe Burrow is less likely to be as careless with the ball as Skylar Thompson. And they have a defense that excel, excels in creating turnovers, especially in the postseason. They forced 11 in their last five games, baiting, dating back to last season's wild card win over the Raiders. And they'll look to bait Allen into taking high risk chances. The Bills need Allen to return to the form he displayed prior to this year. He came into this year's postseason with career numbers of 14 touchdowns against just one pick. Per the Elias Sports Bureau, only two players have led the NFL in turnovers and still reached the conference championship game over the past 45 seasons. Jim Kelly in 1992 and Eli Manning in 2007. If Josh Allen once again turns the ball over three times, Bengals are going to be going to the AFC title game and the Bills will just be the latest addition to my long list of busted preseason Super Bowl predictions. Oh, it's all about you now. Um, okay, so... <laughs> Every now uh, and then it has to be, <laughs> Rabbi. It can't always be so, about you. Start of, 2022, uh, start of the 2022 year, Cincinnati 6-1 and with four three multiple turnovers. Perfect 4-0 and this year. When finishing with three or more takeaways, but for the first time ever in their franchise's history, the Bills freaking won a game while losing the turnover battle. Didn't happen once. And uh, there's another stat we'll, of course, mention in a little bit about turnovers, which is just shocking to me. And Jay, shockingly enough, and he never gets shocked about anything. Yeah, By exactly. the way, <laughs> play, one person to watch for is, despite how meh Josh Allen was last week, the receivers were on their game all game long. Diggs made big catches. I think Gabe Davis lives for the <laughs> first and second round and third game, round Gabe. of the playoffs. And for God's sakes, I hate him so much. And I don't know why he's still in the league, but Cole Beasley was a huge factor in that game. Uh, he is truly a security blanket for whatever team he's unvaccinated on. And uh, <laughs> the very, he did a very good job last week uh, being there for Josh Allen when other options weren't available. But Allen does <laughs> Yeah, I, I would say that about Cole Beasley. I mean, I, I, I don't, I totally disagree with his political views for one point, but when he's on the field, he's a really good football player. You kind of, he's, he's, he's lost, yeah, they get lost in the shuffle. He, he's a, he's a, he's a security blanket, good receiver over the middle that keeps the, keeps drives alive. And that is something that Josh Allen was lacking quite a bit despite that big play offense uh, for most of the season. A guy he could just check it down to instead of taking so many risks downfield. And Dolan is sometimes double and triple team coverage. Hey, look, Stephon like this is a great receiver, but he's not Superman. I mean, give the guy a break. <coughs> no, but he does feel he does feel like he's Superman sometimes. And also, <laughs> also Knox he had a, a touchdown streak <laughs> as well. Uh, by the way, I used to call Cole Beasley the Nat when he was playing for the Cowboys, and I think that is a very he's a pest. He's a very appropriate uh, comparison. All right, Joe, your turn. The Niners and Cowboys is not. A regular season rematch, first playoff matchup this season that has not been a regular season rematch, that why they're played or not played. But a year and six days after the Niners beat America's team last year during the Super Wild Card weekend in Big D by the score of 23 <laughs> to 17. And uh, the loss put more confusion in Jerry Jones's face. Not by Jack Prescott's last drive, but just more like by his face, always looking confused. Here we go again. This time we have a Title game trip on the line, 6.30. Fox is already counting the ad revenue money of this game. That money is flying through the sky, baby. But can Dallas get the job done this time in San Fran and get back to their first conference title game in 27 years? What are you looking for on both sides? Well, again, I think, you know, after the game last year, obviously there's a coaching schism here where you know we, we all know McCarthy's not very good as a mm -hmm. as a head coach and you know mm -hmm. Anthony's asked me that question now four years ago if they thought he was going to be the difference to get them over the top and I think he's the difference that keeps them from getting over the top um, <laughs> he's not a very good head coach he's never been um, so I think that they lose a little bit with that they obviously have good coordinators though and those guys really run that team as far as the players go and as far as the the schemes go so I think it'd be interesting. I think it's, you know, 
the problem with McCarthy being a poor coach, and what I mean by that is, you know, do you continue to force Ezekiel <laughs> Elliott into this game where he's just not a, he's just not that good anymore? Um, nope. It's pretty obvious that he doesn't have that same ability to to run through guys. He's he really doesn't have you know Tony Pollard is so far and away the better back at this point. Um, and it's not just a matter of a change of pace. You could play him on every down and he'd be just fine. So I think that, again, you it's different because you, you look at offense versus defense and you go, okay, Tom Brady, stationary target, really didn't play well, didn't have a lot of weapons, you know, and so they made the Dallas Cowboys defense look good. And when you don't respect the other offense, your offense can play much better. Because, again, you can take a few more chances. You can go for things on fourth down. You can do a lot of different things when you don't care about the other team's offense. And once Tampa Bay started to show that they couldn't, they weren't going to do anything, you know, other than the kicker, everybody on Dallas decided, hey, we can, be, we can throw the ball downfield and we can do stuff. All we have to do is cover Mike Evans. And, again, why they don't force the ball to the bet, one of the top receivers in the league who can make some unbelievable catches – you know, I watched the Manning cast because I couldn't stand listening to anybody else. But, you know, again, and they kept saying, where's my, you know, why don't you just throw it to him? Just throw it at him. Just throw it towards him. You'll get, again, you'll get penalties. You'll get catches. You'll get all kinds of stuff. Why not at least take that chance? And I think that's the reason, you know, Tom Brady's looking to move into Vegas, I guess now. And, you know, everybody in Tampa got fired and, you know, they're going to start from scratch and start all over again. So, but tonight I think it's, you have to respect the San Francisco offense so much. And, you know, Micah Parsons is one of the top or not the, is the top defender in the league at this point. But again, it's one guy. And I think that Shanahan can do enough to, to use that against him, to run towards him, to not put him in spots where he can be the hero of the night. And, and their offense is just so good um, that it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how the, how the Cowboys hold up. The other thing, and I'm going to, pull a little J on you. You know, I normally don't do this, but I actually had a little preparation this morning. So in 2022, Prescott completed just 50.5% of his passes went under pressure. And they, they, they look at blitzing versus under pressure, which for old school guys, you go, well, what's the difference? You go, well, blitzing is when you bring a cornerback or you bring a linebacker or you bring six guys or not just four or five. And so, so what it tells me is Prescott's very good at, at the read beforehand you look out there you see they might be blitzing a safety they may be bringing a cornerback you kind of be able to read it so he knows where he's going when he's just back there and they're rushing four really good guys or they're rushing five really good guys that's when he starts to struggle because he has to read the defense post snap not pre-snap so Prescott completed 55 50.5 percent of his passing under pressure compiling a touchdown to interception ratio of seven to six and having a big time throw rate of 3.4% and a turnover worthy play rate of 4.8%. Prescott tends to hold the ball too long, averaging 3.27 seconds, far below his 2.43 when kept in a clean pocket. So again, when he has to read post snap and gets a little bit of pressure from one side or the other, again, he's a decent runner too. He can move around a little bit. He's, he can break out of the pocket if they're playing man and he realizes that afterwards. But I think that, he succeeds against the blitz because he can go to that hot receiver and knows where to go with it and, and can be accurate with it. When you get him on his back foot, basically because the pressure is coming and from a normal spot and everybody's covering their man that he's only a 50% completion rate. So I think, again, I'm not the only one who read this this morning. So I think that the, the defenders from San Francisco, and that's what they'll do. They'll use their really good pass rushers. They're four or five guys. They won't have to stray from that. They'll be able to double certain guys in certain situations. They'll be able to play the two deep safeties. And again, as long as Tony Pollard's not in the game, I don't think you got to really run, worry about the running game. I think that they can handle that with their linebackers and linemen, their front mm -hmm. seven. I don't think Elliott shows that same burst anymore. And I don't think that he's that threat that he was. So again, if you can shut down a little Dalton Schultz with a safety, because you don't have to worry about certain things and you're not going to be blitzing guys from the secondary, I think it puts a lot of pressure on Dallas. And as long as, you know, last year in that game that San Francisco beat them, you know, they outthought themselves a little bit. They kept doing that tackle where they put the guy and put the tackle in motion to the other side. That's yes. how they lost the game almost because they got called for the penalty. 
don't outthink yourselves. Just run your offense. Just do what you do. You got enough weapons. You, the entire NFL is jealous of the weapons that you have amassed. Don't try to make the friggin' left tackle your star offensive player. Don't you don't have to do that anymore. So don't be too tricky. Don't pull what Minnesota did last week with the throwback to the quarterback in the first quarter and giving up the giving up the one possession that you needed at the end of the game because you might have been ahead at that point instead of being tied. You know, you can't in the in the NFL in the playoffs, which you realized last week, and I think the giant game showed it the most is those little mistakes that we say are little mistakes, motion penalties, false starts, you giving away a possession on your own by not by making your own mistake of giving away a possession, the drop ball by Slayton, all that stuff comes back to haunt you. Unfortunately, you know, okay, the Minnesota gave up a possession for no reason. Slayton dropped the ball, and you both had a penalty that took away first down or a touchdown, and the guy, the game went coming down to the last play of the game. You you have to be you have to be cognizant of this kind of stuff. And that's what beat the Cowboys last year, right? Was yeah. stupid penalties, right? The guy's not getting back and being set, not knowing the, the rule about how to spot the ball. And that, all that little stuff comes back to kill you. And that's why I think McCarthy is the wrong coach for anybody to be successful. You know, you won one Super Bowl with the greatest quarterback to play the game in the last 20 years. <laughs> You know, as a six seed, by the way, just because you won the North every year doesn't make you a dominant team, obviously, as we've seen. So I think that that's where he really hurts them is they're not disciplined enough. They don't know all these rules. You see him on the sideline. And again, we watch it a little bit differently. I see the questions that they ask and see what they're talking about. He's just not a good head coach. Um, I like the fact that he's a head coach, and when we get into the next segment about somebody else. <laughs> yes. I think, I think that's just, the only thing. Yeah. You just said it perfectly, by the way, with him. And I think yeah. that's yeah. the thing is, And those, you know, those, those little mistakes you talk about, Joe, they can't afford them, no. especially going against an offense that has been cooking at the level that, that the 49ers offense is cooking at. I mean, is there a guy who's – who's had more success pulling the strings and basically every button that Kyle, that Shanahan pushes since he acquired McCaffrey has been perfect. I, I mean, I don't know how you beat those guys. I, if they're I think cooking Jay, on all cylinders. Okay. I would say if you watch this game and, and again, how I kind of watch different games because, and then I'll go back and, you know, watch replays and stuff. I think the difference that you have to look at in this game, because the offenses are kind of the keys, look at that stat today. Look at how many, possessions are given away by the offense for no reason so i'm not talking about like last year last week when you said oh you took 10 minutes and only scored three that's not giving away a possession at least no. you got something out of it Fair. like you could have had a, you could add an interception you could add something else but, but how many guys how many possessions are taken away by by penalty and stupid play calls you know trying to trick play for absolutely no reason at all in the first quarter on a third and one it wasn't third and 18 it was third and one. And you thought you had to come up with a trick play to throw back to your quarterback. Who's not a running quarterback. Nope. You weren't throwing it to Daniel Jones. You weren't throwing it to Jalen hurts. You weren't throwing it to Lamar Jackson. Lamar Jackson. I, it to okay, I'm going, I'm going to get, I'm going to get this train back on track here for a very, very <laughs> second no, before we continue no, to criticize right. Minnesota. I, um, it's difficult to not recap what we talked no, about. No, you're right. right. No, you're absolutely <laughs> right. The yeah. one thing I'm very curious about in this game is, Brock Purdy, system quarterback, Shanahan's hiding him very well when he needs to, but Purdy is making the plays. Like last week in the second half of that game, they worked out. He needed to make a few plays to help out that system. What I'm worried about is when this is the best defense that San Francisco is facing in the playoffs, bar none. This is a, this is an elite defensive coordinator. This is an elite defensive scheme. Watch who makes the first mistake in this game. It's likely to be Prescott just because most of his passes are passes. He's number five in um, yards over expected for each throw that he has. So that's why he takes shots. That's what I'm very curious about. The first one to blink in this game is probably going to be the first one to lose. I expect this to be a very good game. And again, Joe said it perfectly. Mike McCarthy's mistakes have been covered because they have they have a coach for everything that Mike McCarthy would have to do or cover up but he doesn't have to do a lot 
he, he's the team spokesperson sometimes, and he's the person that puts out the lineup during the day. But that's one of the reasons why I thought McCarthy would suffer in year two. He's improved in year two because Kellen Moore has improved and Dan Quinn has improved, and Dan Quinn's not going to be there next year, or he <laughs> couldn't be there next year. That's for sure. <clears throat> I mean, if you need to blow and lead in the Super Bowl, you definitely always have that. <laughs> All right, <laughs> moving on. Finally tonight, even though it was treated with the announcing excitement by the announcers like preseason game number four, we're looking at you, Al Michaels and Tony Dungy. We here thought that the Los Angeles collapse <laughs> against the Jacksonville Jaguars last Saturday night is even more intriguing now. As I said before the season, that, sad, that disappointment might be a firing trigger. And even as my solid buddy at arms who has been against Brandon Staley from moment one, Joe Tavaro said that firing should be happening with the loss. Brandon Staley uh, took the 27 Los Angeles lead. I wrote San Diego here, so we're all always going to say San Diego. Oh, that yeah. happened with over 30 minutes plus left, and it led to the third biggest playoff collapse in history, 31-30. Jaguars over Chargers. Gone this week is offensive coordinator Joe Lombardi and QB coach Shane Day. And Shane Day, by the way, just sounds like just be a, more like a PGA tour game than <laughs> is actually a QB coach. So, Joe Taparo, tell the audience the ways on why the wrong people or not enough people were gone after this collapse last Saturday night. Yeah, I, again, I, I don't know how you sit in a meeting after your offense scored 30 points and you gave up more than that in a half and you decide that it's those guys that should get fired. Um, as far as I was concerned, I think, you know, you and I talked during the week, Rabbi, that I think if you, if you thought that Justin Herbert wasn't being developed enough, that you thought that he could do better, if you thought that there was a different system, again, you're up 27 points. Maybe you run the ball more than six times in the second half. I don't know. Just a thought. Maybe, <laughs> but but I'm not saying it's the Rex Ryan coach of disgrace to the coaching <laughs> profession, bad, but it's bad. <laughs> so I think at that point, if you're the owner, you have to step up and get rid of everybody. If that's what you thought that, 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 and that everything contributed to that, you knew somebody was going to go. We thought it would be Staley because it makes more sense. When you have a defensive coordinator that they actually showed during the game and they showed the defensive coordinator sitting up in the box by himself, no headset on, just sitting there. And he's the defense, and they put his name under so everybody knows who the defensive coordinator is. And he goes, no, he's just a practice guy. He runs practice. Staley is the defensive guy. He's got his little card. He calls all the plays. He talks to all the players who are all undisciplined, who don't listen to him, obviously, who, who just are not good players as a team. They're not good as a team. They're good players, individuals. And you, you're responsible for that defense because you're calling the plays and you're the defensive guru that they brought in. And that's what you decided. Instead of being a head coach, you decided to stay as the defensive play caller. And you blow that game. You can't stay. Because if you were just a defensive coordinator like Ed Donatel was, you would have been fired. So how do you keep him as a head coach when he's not a head coach? He's a defensive guy who's not very good at coaching defense. And you let Joey, Bo you know, the – the part I hated the most was, so Joey Bosa, first, okay, so we'll talk a little officiating just real quick. He got upset because he thought the left, the right tackle moved early. Well, if you watch where the ball is, okay, don't watch the guy moving. Watch where the ball is coming between the center's legs. He was probably right on. The real problem is the right, the guard doesn't have to move. The guard just stands up when he pass blocks, okay? The tackle has to move back to cut off the edge and cut off the angle. So it makes it look worse when you see the tackle move and the guard's just still standing there because guess what? He doesn't have to go anywhere. He's just doing this. So the guy wasn't offsides, but even in the Minnesota game and the Giants game, when you thought the guy thought the tackle was offsides, you got to keep playing. You can't stop and stand there and point and go, what good are you doing your team at that point? And then later on in the game, you go to the sideline, you throw your helmet down on the field. And little Brandon Staley, who looks like the ball boy instead of the head coach, <laughs> jogs over and picks the helmet up and hands it back to him, which he then proceeds to throw it down at your feet the second time. And he doesn't get sent to the locker room. Can you imagine what? Okay, Tom so Coughlin, gonna, I, Barcel, anybody standing there and handing his helmet back to him 
I want to stop you right there for a second, and then I'll let you get back to it. He was asked about this in his post-game press conference during the week, and I got a lot more on that, too. Yeah. And uh, Bosa expressed for direct. Here's yeah. what Staley said. <laughs> I saw a player was having a tough moment, and he slammed it down again, and I picked it up again and gave it to him. The culture of our team is as strong as it's ever been since I've been here. What? <laughs> Seriously? You basically caused the fact that you could have gone to overtime if you acted like a coach and let your players shut up. Just saying, you took no responsibility for it. Joe, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna set you up to set you up to get back into your rant. But I mean, sir, I know coaches have to throw, you know, the usual cliches and platitudes out, you know, and say a whole, you know, say a whole lot, not saying anything. Well, you know, under you know, because you don't throw your players under the bus or anything. But uh, I mean, seriously, he come on! Himself, he himself come on! Under the bus, and you didn't have a chance <laughs> to back it up. Yeah, and and it's just it's embarrassing to the profession at that point. You're like, you know, and again, kudos to the to the referees for getting it correct. That it, it that wasn't a it was a second on sports like, but it was a different nature, so you didn't throw him out of the game. But he barely sat him down. He was back out on the field of the next defensive series. You know, again, I'm, I don't like to be too old school and go all the way back to Parcells or, or even go back to Coughlin. But, you know, can you imagine some of these head coaches not no. sending that guy to the locker room and making a point to your team at that moment that, hey, I'm in charge. You don't do this type of thing. You let him be in charge. Maybe he thought he needed him to keep his job. Maybe he thought if he lost Bosa and those guys that they would go to the owner and go, hey, this guy's got to go. He doesn't know what he's doing. Maybe he backs him up at that point. I can't imagine in that moment. In that moment of emotion shows the true colors of the guy that he's not a leader at that moment. To me, he's never been a leader. He's not a leader. He doesn't know how to coach football. The challenge flag is my biggest issue with him in the fourth quarter. So earlier in the game, there was the same exact play on the other way around where the charges got called that it was a completed pass. They went back. They changed it over because they went to this expedited review, which is the exact thing they should be doing in every game because the NFL needs to spend money to hire 20 guys that watch TV. <laughs> it'll be very simple. It'll be so quick. It's called expedited review. It's only used in the playoffs, but it works fantastically. But here's Brandon Staley. The guy makes, makes a catch. They call it complete. And instead of waiting 20 seconds, 25 seconds for the review, by the way, the side judge has his hand up, which means we're looking at the play. Okay, so we're going to look at the expedited review. No, don't wait. Do the gunslinger move, throw out the red flag. He obviously didn't talk to anybody in the booth. And if he did, they should be fired because it wasn't even close. And then you stand there and you go, that, and again, this is why guys used to stick the red flag in their sock and all stuff, hard places to find so that you had to think about it. You didn't just do it as a thing. But you stop the clock for the other team without them using a timeout. You lost. It was a four yard completion for God's sakes. It wasn't like the guy caught it 80 yards down the field. So I think he could still play defense from there. And Trevor Lawrence's thumb was bleeding like he's been shot and you let him go to the sideline for a minute and a half during the review to get fixed up and to talk to the coach and to figure out the rest of the thing. The same thing he did with Oakland last year in the last game where they could take in a tie. He calls a timeout to get his defense set that promptly gave up a 22-yard catch and a field goal and lost the game, and you didn't go to the playoffs. So <laughs> I've told people this all year long. You guys know this. I've texted this to you. I tell every San Diego, L.A. Charger fan that I know around here, you will never win anything with this coach. And if that doesn't prove it to you, nothing well, then you're just crazy. But that owner should have been – he should have been fired last year on the field in Vegas. And you definitely have not, as I wrote to Rabbi, don't even let him on the plane because <laughs> that is and that's my and, and that's a, and again, this is a guy who had a playoff spot literally handed to him on a silver platter and he called and, timeout. And he and he gave it away. Right. He said, No thanks. We don't need any experience. We'll <laughs> we'll just lose next year when we get the experience. Right. <laughs> You're playing going up a one year in time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I, I, I will say this. Uh, Brandon Stanley is cooking becoming everything you don't do as a head coach. I mean, like, now you, you talk about the Joey Bolsa incident, he picked his helmet up. Now, compare that 
to Brian Dable. Yeah. Compare that to <laughs> Brian Dable. Compare that to Brian Dable walking over to Darius Slayton after a key drop and kind of talking back into the game and reminding him, hey, we need you. We got to keep your head up. Let it go. To complete, a complete apple and orange comparison, but it shows a guy, a Brian Dable, who's not just in control, but you see the culture established with the Giants sideline as opposed to the Chargers. And Brett and Stan were looking confused the, the whole second half of that game. Think of it like this. You, you get back to, obviously, giving away a playoff spot last year in Vegas. For whatever reason, two weeks ago, playing his starters deep into the third quarter of a meaningless game, and Mike Williams get injured, and now you don't have him available for a playoff game. And now you look at the second half of last week game in Jacksonville. This is the drives that was lined up. Seven plays, 37 yards, punt. Seven plays, 45 yards. Field goal, 14 plays, 58 yards. I missed field goal. A three plays, five yards. That's a punt. This is in the second half after you scored 27 points. And you basically did everything you possibly could to win a game only to do everything you could do to lose a playoff game. Eckler only has had no yards, six carries, the entire second half. When you have a 27-point lead, Justin Herbert barely didn't do anything in the second half. He threw 134 yards and zero touchdowns in the second half. I don't know what what on earth there was a chance of thinking to take your foot off the gas pedal, but that's what you don't do. It, it was a simple case <laughs> of playing not to lose at a really bad time when you have to bury a playoff team, especially when, they're, when you're on a roll team at, and, and the Jacksonville is at home. The moment that Trevor Lawrence got any kind of momentum, you have to rev it back and you have to rev it back up again, you were in trouble. And, and, and it just, and, and I kind of feel bad for Chargers fans because this is, they lost a playoff game in the most Los Angeles slash San Diego Chargers fashion you could possibly think of when you think of this franchise and how they have lost playoff games over the years. And, 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 just, and, and the only reason why Brandon Staley has a job is because the players like him. That's, uh, that's the only reason why the span of great, that is not, a great move. That'll never, that'll, that'll go well. Yeah. <laughs> that was just the only reason why uh, these Spanos have not put the kibosh on Brandon Staley's coaching tenure after everything that's, that has happened, transpired over the last 15 months with Stanley being a detriment to his own team, let alone being a good a head coach that is capable of taking his team to the next level. And, and now that's going to be the question going into next season. Is he the guy when you have a talented offense, a talented offense, you have one of the <laughs> best young quarterbacks in football right now, you have a good defense, yeah. is yeah. he the guy? Anthony, I'm going to have to, uh, before we get to Jay, I'm going to have to issue a correction on your statement. There are no Los, true Los Angeles Charger fans. There are only <laughs> no. Charger fans. No. And they might have been ran away as well. They're, they're, so, uh, Rabbi, there haven't been that. true Los Angeles Chargers fans since the Chargers were in the AFL. Uh, that might be the last time. If they're still I'll, alive, welcome to the show. <laughs> here's the computer. Here's how you work it. <laughs> yeah. All right, you know, you you guys made your points that Staley should have been fired, and they have plenty of merit. Um, and I and I'm not gonna I, I'm not gonna debate it with you because you guys, you know, I have no argument with it. But when an offense, as Anthony said, when an offense with this many playmakers, starting with quarterback Justin Herbert, takes as big a step back as this one did this season, I doubt it was hard for Staley to sell GM Tom Telesco and ownership that changing coaches on that side of the ball would change their fortunes going forward, unless the order to make those changes came down from on high and Staley had no choice in the matter. Either way, Staley will get to do something he couldn't do when he was hired, and that's get an offensive coordinator who comes from an offense that he's more familiar with and likely more comfortable with, one based on the Shanahan, LaFleur, McVay model that he saw every day as defensive coordinator of the Rams. Staley was asked in his end of season press conference if he would once again try to get an OC from that coaching tree. And his answer was pretty much a yes. Here's the quote. It's fair to say that the experience that I have, that's a fair assessment of the style of play because that's the offense that I believe in. 
It's not an excuse, but from what I'm hearing, Lombardi, who is a Sean Payton disciple, spending most of his career as the Saints quarterback coach, working with Drew Brees with a two-year run as the Lions OC from 2014-15 in between, was Staley's fourth choice as offensive coordinator. The Chargers did talk to Shanahan, LaFleur, McVay, tree names like Mike McDaniel, Kevin O'Connell, and Nathaniel Hackett for the OC job. But according to sources, various factors led to Staley having to go with Lombardi when he was putting that first staff together. That all being said, in their second season in Lombardi's offense, the Chargers went from a top five offense in 2021 to a below average offense in 2022 per football outsiders DVOA efficiency metric. Injuries were a big factor. Yes, you know, losing the likes of Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, Rashawn Slater, Trey Pipkins, and Corey Lindsley for multiple games being the biggest. But this team needs to get more out of their franchise quarterback. And that played a big part in moving on from Lombardi and an offensive scheme that was limiting Herbert and leaving a very thin margin of error. Running game, frustration with it all year. Lombardi was quick to abandon it, even when they were finding success with it. Chargers ran design runs on just 37.6% of their second downs with between two and six yards to gain, what we call second and manageable. That was the lowest rate in the NFL, according to True Media, which also had them ranked 29th in explosive run rate any running play of 12 yards or more, and ranked seventh worst in the NFL in rate of rushes for zero or negative yards. Pass offense. Chargers should have a much better passing attack considering they have Herbert, right? But too often Lombardi would lean into shorter developing root concepts and play designs. And over these past two seasons, Herbert threw at or behind the line of scrimmage on 22% of his pass attempts, ranked 31st out of 35 quarterbacks in air yards per attempt at 6.96. There were too many tight windows and condensed areas of the field, not enough easy completions with the threat of an explosive play built in. Chargers, 21st in explosive pass rate on early downs over Lombardi's two seasons as OC. According to True Media, they define explosive pass play as any completion longer than 15 yards. In that same end of season press conference, Staley said, quote, there's a different level that we need to play at offensively, particularly at the line of scrimmage in the run game and having the marriage of the run in the past, creating more explosions on early downs. And I think there's just a style of play that is still out there for us. You're always going to try and take your game to a different level. And that's what it's about us creating that optimum level that I know our team can get to offensively End quote, he'll get one more shot to create that optimum level guys. Because as I said to you on our group text, if Brandon Staley was a cat, he'd now be completely out of his nine lives. And, and Jay, I agree with everything you said. And I, I understand the offense, you know, really didn't perform as, as well as everybody thought it should do. But the fact that you couldn't hire a guy when you knew you were going to be the head coach of the chargers, and you knew who your quarterback was going to be, that shows that you're not a head coach. You got guys that. Hey, I, I, I don't know. Coach. They Nobody had detailed the reasons you couldn't get any of those three guys. I would love to know what those reasons were because of, these are three guys he has familiarity with. How could the Chargers not manage to hire one of them? It makes you wonder, is that Staley's issue? Was it the GM or the ownership's issue not being able to get one of those three guys? Nobody's talking about that. So it'll be interesting to see, especially now that we know there's a LaFleur available, Hackett is available. So it'll be interesting to see who that, if he actually gets his the guy he actually wants this time around, which will but, be his probably it will be his last time around. Yeah, and, and I think you're right, Jay, because I think it's you know I really want to hire Jay, but Jay says, well, I don't think Joe can handle the job, and I think he's going to be gone in two years. So why do I want to go there? Is that the is that the case where they don't believe in him? <clears throat> right, Just that's because, the question. Oh, I want to I want to hire you know so and so. Well, that doesn't mean you're going to get the guy, or it doesn't mean he wants to work for you. And, and we all know San Diego's cheap. We all know they don't want to spend money. They yep. didn't want to move into the new stadium. They didn't, you know, they can't pay their rent. It's the, it's the same story, you know, why Eli Manning's that was, didn't go there. It, and it'll never change. <laughs> no, uh, not as long as that ownership group's in place. No, not, and, and that ownership group, even if they sell Jay, they're stuck in that shadow of playing in that big stadium that they can't sell out. And they never yep. will because people are still pissed at them. From For leaving San Diego. Stadium. Yeah. You know, I have a few guys that bought season tickets in LA when they moved to, from San Diego. Actually, one of them went down to Duval this week and, and, to see, <laughs> and to see them play that game. And I said to him when he came back, I said, he looked at me, he goes, you're right. We'll never win with that head coach. And I said, because he's not a head coach. People have to understand what that job title really yeah. is. And they yeah. just and, and it's something we have discussed. You know, there, there's a big difference when you move that, you know, we talk about in terms of like the NBA, it's a big difference when you move that one seat over 
you know, and, yeah. and now everything is on you. And, you know, you and Joe, you and I talked about it and we agreed the best decision Brian Dable made was to not be a play caller in his right. first year as a head coach. Some guys can do it. Some guys can't. Shanahan's shown that he's a guy who can do it. We, but you know, we there are plenty of examples of guys who can't do it. Mike McDaniel in Miami at the beginning of the year decided not to be a play caller so he could understand and learn how to actually be a head coach. He took over play calling later in the year when he finally got comfortable with everything and figured out a way to be able to do both. But as you and I know, most guys can't do both. And I and I also think that if you're if you're on the Chargers and that offense struggles that that much during the year, why is the guy still there at the end of the year, right? Get rid of him in the middle of the year or make a change or do something at that point where you show that you're, to me, it's disingenuous to go into the press conference afterwards and go, well, you know, I really wasn't comfortable with the offense and it's not really our personality. And I, well, then do something about it. Again, you're the friggin' head coach. Do yeah. something. Don't yes, just stand there with this, little not everybody can be Andy Reid and some guys best destiny is as a coordinator. And if that's where you top out, you know what? There are worse things to be than a long term, you know, offensive or defensive coordinator in the NFL. But, well, you have to figure that out, though, before it happens. And that's why Josh McDaniels took so long to be an offensive coordinator. And he's probably not going to last in the Raiders if he can <laughs> on the path that he did last year. So, by the way, Herbert got injured in week two this season. He played through broken ribs for most of the season. So that is one of the reasons, not the main, he played the whole season. That and the injuries hurt him a bunch. But I do I do think there's still a lot of growth that needs to be done. And that, and, and that was another point, Rabbi, that everybody made around here was he never should have played in that Jacksonville game, which was no. the, next week. the and stupidest again, move ever. Again, head coaching, is he deferring to Lombardi and the quarterback coach? Is he listening to his medical people? Is he listening to the quarterback? Again, bad decisions come back to bite you no matter how early in the season they happen. It's it, And there's a limit on how many your owner will allow yeah. you to make. Before. But again, if the owner's not interested and he's, you know, doing something else, then that's you get away with it a little I'm bit. Not, yeah, and I have I'm not like, sure if the Spados no. family knows that they still own that team. But I'll tell you this, know Telesco knows. knows <laughs> and Telesco knows that his job is on the line. So if the Chargers implode like this again, Telesco knows he has to fire Staley for no other reason than to save his own job. No, I don't think the Spanish is where they even play in L.A. It's, it's no, probably yeah, not. I'm not, not sure. Not sure. Well, we'll have to investigate that and we'll get back into the answer. <laughs> because the Spanos is actually having a cognizance. All right, we've got a few more of <laughs> <laughs> we could do we could do a long list of that. Yes, we, we got could. a few more. <laughs> we've got a few more of these, so the football talk isn't over yet. But we'll do that next week. What things can we add? Join us next week for a conference championship edition of the show, and we'll tell you. For Jay Kaplan, Anthony Strait, and thank you again for joining us, Mr. Joe Safara. Hopefully, we will see thank you, you next sir. week for a possible Cowboys, um, Giants, and NFC Championship. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Stephen Rab- I'm Stephen Rabinowitz. The socials are Facebook.com slash on the sports lines live, YouTube.com slash on the sports lines on demand. And we're getting close to baseball season, Jay. So that's Twitter better be popping soon. Uh, I just <laughs> dropped uh, Jason Stark's piece on his Hall of Fame ballot and his whys and wherefores behind what he why he made the votes he didn't didn't make. It's on our Twitter. Uh, it's on our Twitter page. It's at O N T H Sports Lines, and it even though it is football season, that it's definitely worth a read. You'll also see the link to this show when it comes up later today. Uh, see you next week. Enjoy the weekend. Enjoy the games. Go Giants. Have a good afternoon. Have a good one. Good afternoon, everyone. See you guys.